Good morning. Welcome to Three Lakes Evangelical Free Church. We're excited you are here on this Sunday morning. My name is Pastor Ian. I'm the youth and family pastor, and you get me today rather than Pastor Tim, so hope that's okay. Um, if you are new or visiting, we would love to hear from you. In the seat in front of you, there is a Connect card. You can fill that out and place it in the boxes on the back wall. That is also where tithes and offerings can be placed if you uh, are so inclined to give. So this morning what's going to kind of happen is we are going to have our worship service until about 10 or 10.15, and then we're going to have some fellowship time downstairs, coffee, snacks. Um, make sure that you get downstairs fast enough if you want those snacks so you beat the kids. Otherwise, you probably won't get any, just so you know. And then at 10.30, there will be Sunday school for all ages downstairs, um, and then adult Sunday school up here will start at 10.45. There's some sermon discussion and that kind of thing if you are interested. If you would look at the back of your bulletins with me, there are a couple announcements that we'd like to highlight. First of all, there is a Kids Sunday worship service coming up on September 29th. All ages are welcome to participate, um, even adults. If the kids need an adult on stage with them, that's fine. So, and no, this is not a ploy just to expand our worship team either. We're just saying if, if the kid needs a parent, they can come up. If you want more information, you can talk to Emma Sagert. Um, there's the, her contact info right there. Also, if you are interested in membership, uh, just want to have a conversation about it, you can talk to Pastor Tim about that. Uh, rather than having formal membership classes uh, certain times of the year, he is doing it uh, singular person by person as they come to him. So as we get started with our worship service, I would uh, invite you to join a time of contemplation and sil silence. This is also a great time to silence your phone or put it on do not disturb, whatever you're gonna do, just to take all the distractions, leave them behind, and just enter into worship with us. So it's my job now to call you to worship, and we're going to do something that's a little different. You know, in the tradition that I grew up in, we recited the Apostles' Creed every Sunday, and I thought as we're starting to worship, it's a good idea to just remind each other of what we believe. So let's stand together, and uh, the words will come onto the wall, and let's call each other to worship by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. They're already standing, so let's call each other to praise the name of the Lord together.
Would you pray with me? Dear Father, we come before you praising your name, Lord. We know that you are worthy. We thank you so much for who you are. Many times it's easy to, to be thankful for what you've done. But what you do, have done would not be important except for the fact of who you are. And we thank you for that. We know you are a God that is with us, and we thank you for that. We know you are a God who knows our pain. And there are many of us that, that are hurting. We think of some families in our congregation. We think of the Olgrens and Dittermans, or Dittmers. We ask that you would make your presence obvious to them. We think of Connie Turner. After a fall, we pray that you would speed her healing and uh, keep having her get better, Lord. We thank you that we are a church that gets to gather together in this place. It's easy to overlook the, the fact that we live in a free country. We thank you for that. We thank you that we can have Sunday school every Sunday during the school year. I ask that you would bless our Sunday school as it started last week. Help us to um, minister to these kids well. Help these kids to understand who you are well. Uh, we thank you so much that we're a church that has kids in it. And we ask that you would continue to help us to grow in that way. I ask that you would help us to fellowship well downstairs. Lots of times it's easy for strife or other things that get in the way to, to derail our fellowship, to derail our relationships and, and loving each other well as you've called us to. I ask for the rest of this worship service that you would help us to worship honestly, without distraction, not worrying about all the other things that are around us, the things that are happening, the the hard things that happened this week, the arguments we had, the relationships that are broken, but rather that we would focus on you and realize that you are the one, you are the one who will help us through all of that. You are the one who will pave the way for us and give us strength. I ask that you would give us just a great Sunday, Lord, Help us to focus on you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. As you've heard me say before, the guys from the Bible Project are going, taking this whole year to work through the Sermon on the Mount, little by little. And they've showed us that right in the exact center of the center of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus teaching the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to watch a video that um, talks about that, and then we will actually stand together, and before we sing again, we will recite together the Lord's Prayer. So let's watch the video. The Sermon on the Mount is one of the most important collections of the teachings of Jesus, and it has three parts, an introduction, a main body, and a conclusion. Now, the main body is the central part of the sermon, and in it, Jesus calls his followers to live by a higher standard of right relationships with God and with other people. And the main body itself has three parts, looking at this righteousness from three perspectives. Now, this central part here is about how righteousness should be expressed in the religious practices of Jesus' day. And this section also has three parts. In the middle, Jesus addresses three religious practices. And the central practice that he highlights is prayer. Ah, oh, this is where Jesus teaches his disciples the Lord's Prayer. You got it. So the Lord's Prayer is at the center of the center of the center of the entire Sermon on the Mount. And it's here because Jesus wants this prayer to have a central place in the lives of his followers. The prayer begins, Our Father who is in the skies. Notice the prayer does not begin with my Father. Jesus wants us to remember that we belong to a worldwide family, appealing to God together as 
our Father. Father is a really intimate way to address God. Yes, this was Jesus' favorite term for God, which portrays God as the source of life and provider for his children. And notice that Jesus balances that intimate term with a more cosmic description, in the skies. So did Jesus think God is in the sky? It's a metaphor. Just as the skies are high above us, so God is above and beyond every category in our imagination. Yet, he's also close, like a good father. Now that we've addressed God, the prayer continues in three requests. The first is, May your name be recognized as holy. So what's the significance of God's name being holy? Well, in the Bible, holiness is the unique, one-of-a-kind status God has as the creator of all things. And in the story of the Bible, God attaches his holy name and reputation to the people of ancient Israel by partnering with them to bring blessing to the nations. But Israel breaks that partnership, and that led them to be conquered by other nations. Exactly. And God's holy reputation was discredited among the nations. But Israel's prophet said that one day God would act to restore the holiness of his reputation. Jesus is inviting his followers to pray for that to happen. But how? Well, that's what the prayer turns to next. May your kingdom come, and may your will be done. As it is in the skies, so also on the land. God's heavenly kingdom is a holy realm where God's will is always done. So Jesus wants us to ask for that realm to come down here. So his heavenly will is done on the land. Right, and that word will could also be translated as desire. This prayer is meant to align our desires with God's desire to bring heaven to earth. And notice the repetition, your name, your kingdom, your will. This first half of the Lord's prayer has three requests that God act in our world to renew creation. And the second half of the prayer shifts the focus to asking God for help so we can be a part of that renewal. Our daily provision of bread give to us today. Most humans are full of worry and fear about our survival, and so we hoard resources. But Jesus invites us to trust God to meet our needs one day at a time. This kind of prayer cultivates a habit of daily gratefulness to see every meal and every moment as a gift. Why focus on bread? Jesus is recalling the story of Israel wandering in the wilderness when God sent bread from heaven, but just enough for one day at a time so that Israel had to stay in a posture of gratefulness and trust. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven those indebted to us. So what are our debts? Well, debt is a metaphor for when you wrong someone and then owe them to make it right. It's a relational debt. And notice the symmetry here. The prayer asks God to forgive our debts just as we forgive those who owe us. Our ability to receive God's forgiveness is bound up with our ability to give out forgiveness. Jesus is creating a culture where the forgiven become agents of forgiveness to others. And don't lead us into the test but deliver us from the evil one. Now, I learned this prayer as, don't lead us into temptation. The Greek word is perasmos, which means a test that is designed to reveal the truth. In the Bible, God's tests have a positive purpose, to reveal someone's character and invite them into a relationship of trust. Okay, then why ask God to spare us from tests? Jesus is being really honest here. Tests can be difficult or painful. And often, there's a little voice nudging me to take the easy way out because the right choice is just too costly. Jesus says that's the voice of the evil one. So when tests come and we hear that voice, we should ask for deliverance. Exactly. Now, notice this second half of the prayer has four requests that focus on our needs. Give us bread, forgive our debts, don't lead us, and deliver us. Combine that with the three requests from the prayer's first half. And you get seven requests. That's a common number for completeness in the Bible. Yes, the prayer of Jesus shapes us into people who long for God's heavenly kingdom and desire to come about here on the land. And we can participate as we learn to trust God, forgive others, and remain faithful to God's promise to bring heaven down to earth. Let's stand together and let's Repeat that prayer together, and then let's sing about it. Our Father who is in the skies, may your name be recognized as holy. May your kingdom come, and may your will be done, as it is in the skies, so also on the land. Our daily provision of bread, give to us today, 
and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven those indebted to us. And don't lead us into the test, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen.
God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Cherubim and seraphim cry, holy, holy, holy. They cover themselves because in your presence of holiness, oh, their eyes cannot look directly upon you. For you are truly the exalted one, truly the one who shines glorious, the one who is brighter than the sun, the one who needs no light because he is the light. Oh Lord, we worship you this morning, reminding ourselves that you are high and lifted up. You are exalted. You have the name that is above all names, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, we are truly, truly sorry when we forget exactly who you are. When the other things seem to take on a power that is yours alone. When other things command our thoughts and fill our lives when that position is yours alone. Forgive us, O oh Lord, when we forget that you are the sovereign God and that everything, everything is underneath the feet of Jesus Christ, that in him, everything, everything you say, everything you do is yes and amen. So our Lord, this morning as we worship you, may we gaze upon your holiness. May we remind, be reminded that you have commanded us to be holy as you are holy. And God, you're not telling us to be God. You're not telling us to, to become to become this, I don't even know, Lord, what the right word is. What you are asking of us is that we would be guided by the one principle that guides you, love. That, God, we would be so filled with your love that we gaze upon you in awe and worship you day in and day out. That we gaze upon our world with awe because your hand is visible in our world. That we gaze upon our fellow brothers and sisters, the humans around us, and we see your fingerprints, we see your imprint on them. And Lord, we love them. We love them because you love them. And we look at ourselves. And God, all those things that disappoint us, all those things that cause us to look and say, if only I could be different. All of those things burn up beneath the gaze of your holy love. That you, the holy one, you, the pure one, you, the one before whom evil cannot stand, can look at us, the redeemed, and you are pleased. You are pleased. So our God, as we listen to Ian today, bring the word to us. May we hear your voice. May you hear, may we hear what you are saying to us, your people. And God, if there's anyone in this room who still cannot call themselves yours, they cannot call themselves a child of the Most High God, Father, would you show them what Jesus did, that they might be adopted, and Lord, may this be the day when their adoption is made complete. Lord, hear our prayers as we lift them up to the one we know hears everything, knows everything, and is confused by nothing. Lord, we love you. Holy, holy, holy. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship you. Amen. And amen. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Would you please be seated? Thank you, Marcy. If you are in 4K through second grade, you guys are welcome to go downstairs for Children's Church. So this morning we are going to be in Judges chapter 6, uh, talking about the story of Gideon, and I invite you to uh, take a Bible, it, the, it will not be on the screen, so there are Bibles in front of you, um, 
if you would like to do that. So this week marked seven years of me and Cami being up here with. So as I was thinking through those seven, that, that time, um, I was thinking about a conversation I had with someone following the vote that, that brought us here and the, all the candidating and everything else. And uh, the guy who I was talking to said that there were two very distinct reactions to the news of us getting the job. There was Cami, who was super excited, like, oh yeah, this is going to be great. Ian's going to be youth pastor. We're going to be up here. This is going to be great. And then there was me, who was like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of responsibility. This, it was the weight settling on my shoulders. It might have been that I had that day taken over the 7th, 8th, and ninth grade boys Sunday school <laughs> just before that, which the last one of them who was in that class graduated this last year, so that was, that was pretty weird. But um, there, were, there was a feeling for me that I don't know if I am ready for this. I don't know if I'm up for taking on this challenge. And we're going to see that with Gideon, is that he is a man of, well, he doesn't have high aspirations for himself, but God intervenes. So in Judges, we have this very interesting time period in Israel's history. It's just after the conquest by Joshua. Joshua shows up with Israel. They come in, they conquer the land, and they take out most of the tribes that are owning Israel at the time. Now, what is a judge? When I think of the word judge, I usually think of someone who has a black robe and kind of long curly wig, right? White wig. That's not what we were talking about. Judges in Israel's context are men and women who God specifically empowered to lead Israel for a time usually sent to a singular geographical area in their time of need. And when you look at the book of Judges, you find that there's this judges cycle that happens over and over again. And it starts out with Israel following a false god. Israel saying, you know what, I will worship God, but I also like worshiping these other gods at the same time. And as they do that, God sees it and he says, you know what, you're going in the wrong direction. It's going to be bad. So some kind of foreign power comes in and starts oppressing the people. Um, and they are put into servitude, all right? So sin, servitude. So Israel, after some time, they're like, oh, no, help. God, come and help us. So they ask, they supplicate, they ask for God to save them. And God ri raises up someone to save them. And then after that, that judge rules for a time. And during that time, there's peace. There is stillness. There is no more strife in the land. And then the judge dies. And guess what happens? They go back to what they were doing. So Gideon is the fourth judge. He's kind of the one that is the fulcrum of before, before Gideon, the judges are pretty good. Stuff's pretty good. Bad stuff happens, but it's not too bad. After Gideon, the wheels fall off. You read the book of Judges, and it kind of just gets weirder and weirder. The time of the Judges can be summed up in a single verse. In Judges 21, 25, it says, and there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Sound familiar? Sound like a time that we kind of live in? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So Gideon follows behind judges like Ehud, who is known as the assassin judge. He's left-handed, and he's known for sneaking into a guy's castle, killing the king, and leaving without them realizing it. Ehud rules for 80 years after this. He's like the longest ruler in Israel's history. And Deborah and Barak, Deborah was a prophetess, Barak was a commander of men. But when Deborah came to Barak and said, hey, you need to go here and fight Israel's enemies, Barak said, sure, I'll go and do that as long as you come with me. And so Deborah said, you will not get the honor of killing the enemy king. Instead, it will go to another. Then we have Gideon. So I'm going to start. This is the setup for Gideon. Israel, so this is 6 verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the, sight, in the Lord's sight, 
So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. You guys might remember that the Midianites from Moses. Moses, his uh, father-in-law, is from the Midianites. The Midianites were usually, previous to this, viewed as good people. But now they are raiding Israel. So what they're doing is the Midianites are sitting in the desert. And they wait around till the spring. And they're like, or to the fall, till there's harvest. And they're like, okay, we're going to come in here. We're going to take all of the food all of it, and they're going to take it back with them. So Israel is facing starvation. It says um, in verse 4, they left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. The enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. So then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. So this is the setup. A prophet comes then and says, hey, God's heard your cry, and he's going to do something for it. Enters, here's Gideon. Gideon is brought up in verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abizer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. So when you think of threshing wheat, the process is that you take the, the kernels off of the stalks, you put it in this basket, and you throw it up into the air. And the wind comes and takes the chaff, and you're left with the seeds, the hard, heavy seeds that you're going you're gonna to actually eat. So he is down in a wine press doing this. Do you think the wind is going to take too much of that chaff away? No, he's, he's pretty much in a hole. Okay? He's sitting in a hole, hiding from, from the Midianites, and he's trying to, to um, thresh his wheat. Not working so well. Um, So the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Hi, coward. What are you doing down here? No. He says, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And Gideon's like, Me, sir? Me? He says, Sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us us over to Midianites. So Gideon knows his history. He knows that there were great things that happened in the past. And he's like, why is this happening? The Lord turns to him and said, go with strength, the strength you have, and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Gideon again has something to say about that. But Lord, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole of the tribe of Manasseh. I'm the least in my entire family. So he's a younger son. He's not the oldest son. He's like, look at me. I'm not up for this. Look, I'm I'm standing in a wine press threshing wheat. Why are you sending me? The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. So again, still is doubtful. He's like, if... If this is true, I'm going to go and get an offering if you'll wait back here and you prove to me that you're God. So the angel of the Lord says, I will stay here until you return. So Gideon hurried home. He cooks this young goat. He cooks a meal. He comes back. He carries it all in a basket, broth in a pot, and he presents it to the angel who was under the great tree. The angel of the Lord says to him, Place the meat and the unleavened bread on the rock and pour your broth over it. So Gideon does that, puts it all there. He touches the meat, and it all is burned up. Done. And the angel of the Lord disappears. So Gideon suddenly realizes this isn't just a normal angel. He says, O sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. So when you hear the phrase angel of the Lord in scripture, you need to not think normal angel. 
right? Not your normal run of the mill angel that you see every day. <laughs> right? This is this is known as a Christophany. Okay? Don't ask me to spell it. Christophany. And it is Christ showing up in the Old Testament. Okay? And Gideon realizes it. He realizes, oh my goodness, I have seen the face of God. Now you'd think, after you see the face of God, who says, hey, I'm going to be with you, and I just incinerated the meal that you brought for me, that you just slaved over, um, you would think that he'd be like, okay, sounds good. I can do everything that God asked me to do. I don't need to worry about things. The obstacles in front of me will be gone. Not so much. So after he's, he's scared by this, God again talks to, him and talks to him and he says, it's going to be all right. Go into the town, build me an altar. Um, you're not going to die. So he goes into town. Verse 25. That night the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, pull down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah's pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully, sacrifice the bull's burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah's pole you cut down. So Gideon goes into town, he sneaks in at night, he cuts down the Asherah pole, he takes out the... the Baal, he makes an altar, and he does all of this at night. So the next morning, everyone wakes up and they're like, cool, you took down our, our uh, idol that we weren't supposed to be worshiping. Thank you so much for calling us out like that. No, they're ticked off and they're like, they go to Joash, his dad, they're like, bring us your son. He messed up, he needs to pay for this. The interesting thing is Joash is kind of in charge of the Asherah pole and the Baal. So it's, it's not just like, oh, your son might have done this. It's like, no, you, who's the priest of Baal and Asherah, you are the one whose fault this is. Um, so they ask him to bring it out. Joash shouts back over the mob. He's like, why are you defending Baal? Will you be the one who will defend him? He says this in verse 31. If Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down this altar. And Gideon gets a new nickname, Jeroboam, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. And in some, some Bibles later on, he's not referred to as Gideon anymore. He's called Jeroboam, so don't be confused by that. I don't know if I'd love like the nickname of someone's false god to be part of my new nickname, but, you know. Whatever. So Gideon does all this, and he sees that um, Midian and the Amalekites, all of them are gathering, they're forming an alliance against Israel, and they cross the Jordan, and they're camping in the valley of Jezreel. If you're wondering where this is, it's kind of north, the north central highlands of Israel, south of Galilee. So that's where this is happening. So north of Shiloh, but uh, still kind of in that central area. So Gideon, he's like sent to take on these guys. So he summons all of these warriors and Gideon still is like, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, God, if you wanted me to do this, which I think is kind of crazy considering that he's realized he's seen the face of God survive and his town didn't try and kill him for taking out their altar, their idols. But Gideon still is not 100% sure, so he has another test, right? He says, hey, I'm going to put a fleece out on the threshing floor, and it's going to first, I want you to make the fleece wet and the floor dry. And then after that happens, which he's like, oh, cool. But that could have been a fluke. Definitely could have been a fluke. Maybe, maybe, just maybe. So then he flips it over and he says, instead, how about the floor wet and the fleece dry? And God again says, okay, I'll show you. Even though that you're doubting me again, I will show you that I am God. So it happens. Um, it's interesting because through this passage, even if you look in verse 39, Gideon said to God, please don't be angry with me. He's like, I know that I'm pushing my limits. Please don't be angry with me, but let me make one more request. Let me use this fleece for one more test. And again, God shows up there. So Gideon... He gathers his army, um, 
and he gets ready, gets ready to take him on, and God talks to him and says, hey, Gideon, you got too many soldiers. Okay? So he sends some way. He says, hey, if you're afraid or you're timid, go home. So 22,000 of the 32,000 that he had gathered went home. So he's got 10,000 men. And God says again, nope, you got too many soldiers. So then Gideon has a test, right? They go to a river. He says, take a drink from the river. Some of them uh, put their faces in like dogs, and they lap at the water. Others put in their hands, and they drink. And he says, okay, the ones that drank with, with their hands, we'll keep them. The ones that drank like dogs, go home. So he now has 300 men. So he went from 32 to 10 to 300 men. Now, as a kid, whenever I read this story, there was always this like deep, deep uh, thought behind the whole like drinking with your hands or just putting your face in the water. I don't, I don't think there was a big, big thing with that. I think it's more like God said, I want 300 men, and so 300 men are going to drink like that. And that was the end of it. So you guys know the rest of the story. The 300, they gather together. They go at night to the Midian's camp, which they're kind of down in this valley, and they surround the Midianites. They've got pots uh, with, with torches in them, and they've got horns, and they all smash the pots, and they pull the torches out, and they yell uh, the sword of the Lord and for Gideon, and the whole camp is in disarray. God turns the, the men against each other, and they end up killing each other, and the, all the Midianites, they lose, and they run out of the camp. Okay? Some, of them, some of them have dreams about things that are happening, and it's a great victory for Israel. Okay, so after this, Gideon kind of really comes into his judgeship, okay? He starts making some decisions that are uh, more in line with who he is. He goes and he gets the rest of the men that had, had left, the, so they, there were 300 that were with him, the rest of the men, and he said, hey, you can come and chase the enemy. Some of these guys were kind of ticked that they didn't uh, get to do that, um, so they, they keep going. Uh, Gideon hunts down the kings. So the king's name are Oreb and Zeb. Um, they're also sometimes identified as commanders rather than, than um, kings. And so two of them get killed. Two more are still running. Eventually they end up at a, at a town and they ask, he, Gideon asks, hey, can you, can you give us some food? And the town's like, how about you finish killing the Midianites and then we'll help you? Which is like, they're a little worried about the Midianites coming back, pretty much. And Gideon says, okay, we'll do that. But if that happens, this is what I'm going to do. So this is verse 7 of chapter 8. So Gideon said, after the Lord gives us victory over Zeba and Zulamona, those are the last two kings, I will return and tear your flesh with the thorns and briars from the wilderness. So he's like, I'm, I'm going to come back. You're going to see my authority. And eventually that's what happens. They, they go, they come back. Um, they take out the, the enemy. Um, and I, that's kind of the end of the story on one level, right? They win. Um, Gideon's son, Gideon asks his son to execute the kings. And Gideon's son's like, no, I'm too scared. I'm not doing that. So Gideon ends up killing them. But Gideon takes the royal ornaments from all of their camels, from the kings, and he takes them back, and those are important in a little bit. So if you would turn in, uh, in your Bibles to 8.22, this is kind of the, the final bit about Gideon's um, time. So Israel's won. Gideon's killed the kings. So verse 22, then the Israelites said to Gideon, be our ruler. You and your sons and your grandsons will be our rulers for you have rescued us from Midian. So the judges never were a dynasty. Okay. And what I mean by that is no judge became judge and then their son was the, the leader. Even when you look at the final judge, so Samuel is the final judge. Previous to him, it was led by a guy named Eli. Now, Eli had sons that Israel looked at and said, no, we don't want them leading us. 
And God also didn't want them leading Israel. And the sons end up getting killed rather than leading. Samuel ends up being the, the judge, and he, again, Israel looks at his sons and says, I don't want them leading. And that's how Saul becomes king. So Israel wants Gideon as their king. Now remember, this is a guy who, was, uh, who needed to be reassured by God three times before he did anything. Okay, Let's just make that very clear. So in the face of this temptation, this is what Gideon says, I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you. However, I do have one request for each of you. Uh, each of you give me an earring from the plunder you collected from your fallen enemies. The enemies being Ishmaelites, they all wore gold earrings. Gladly, they replied, they spread out a cloak and they each threw a gold earring uh, he had gathered from the plunder. The weight of the gold earrings was 43 pounds, not including the royal ornaments and pendants and gold clothing worn by the king of Midian's, uh, uh, kings of Midian or the chains around the necks of their camels. So Gideon made a sacred ephod from the gold uh, and put it in Ophrah, his hometown, but soon all of Israel uh, prostituted itself by worshiping it, and it became a trap for Gideon and his family. So, gold ephod. I, you know, as much as ephods are in style nowadays, I haven't seen one in a while. So, a gold ephod is this, like, vest kind of chest plate. It's square that the, um, that the, the priests would wear, and in it there were special stones that were um, kind of put into it. So they take this ephod and put it up, and it's kind of this, it's supposed to be this commemoration. So previous to this, Israel commemorates battles and great things by putting up standing stones or piles of stones. Okay. Gideon instead, he puts this thing up, and immediately the people are like, yeah, we'll worship God, but we also can worship this. So that's what they did. Um, this thing becomes, a, as it says, it becomes a snare. If you read chapter 9 and further, you get to hear the story of Abimelech, who is Gideon's son. He doesn't do great stuff. It doesn't work out well. And the cycle again repeats itself. Um, and it's, it's honestly, Judges is a very ugly time in Israel's history, if you read it. But it's, it's pretty interesting. So we read all that. We've got Gideon, all of that, and you're like, Ian, <clears throat> you know, it's been a while since I've been raided by Midianites, and so thanks for telling me what to do. No. This story stands uh, to show us that throughout history, God has used men and women who have seen from the, seen from the outside as the worst possible pick. This is the designed um, to show us that it is not them who is strong enough to achieve that which God calls them to do, but rather God working through them. I mean, Gideon is the prime example. He's literally visited by Jesus, and Jesus does fireworks for him, and yet he still doubts his ability so much that he has to do it over and over again, right? He has to ask over and over again for God's reassurance. Yet through this, God still shows mercy and his sovereign will for saving Israel through all this. So Gideon, if you would rate him on a scale of 1 to 10 as a good leader for Israel, where would you rate him? I think I'd rate him probably as a 4, right? He did okay, but it wasn't great. I think I would rate other people way higher, especially when you look at how much faith he had in God. But if you go to Hebrews... And I'll read the verse. This is Hebrews 11, 32 through 35. This is part of a passage called the Hall of Faith, or the, yeah, I've just always been told it's the Hall of Faith. It's where God takes and he points out all of those who had great faith in God. In verse 32, God says this, How much more do I need to say it would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. 
By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back against, from death. But others were tortured and refused to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. So literally, Gideon is highlighted as being a man of great faith, even though that we see him over and over again. I would say not exercising faith, but rather doubting the whole way that God has something better for him. God's sovereign presence in our lives empowers us to follow him even in the face of hard things, such as nagging doubts about our status. I mean, think about in verse 12 of chapter 6, where it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. All of us have been called to do hard things and do things that God has called us to do. Some of it's easy, some of it's Uh, stuff that is just easy. Um, Other stuff is super, super hard. I think about uh, how many of you guys have ever had to go to someone and say, hey, I'm wrong, can you forgive me? I think that's super hard. Um, But all of that is operant on our status with Christ. Christ came as a man, experienced life as a human, He wept, he cried, he cut himself, he eventually died on a cross and rose again on the third day so that we could change our status, that we are not enemies of God, but rather children of God, that we can follow him. Now, when God calls us to be his children, he calls us to do hard things. He calls us to follow him in a world that doesn't want to follow him. He calls us to uh, love people that don't want to be loved by us who don't love us, who are our enemies. So God's sovereign presence should change the doubts about our status. Secondly, God's sovereign presence in our lives empowers us to follow him even when we're faced with seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Gideon had, well, first of all, his own doubts about himself that he had to deal with. He had a family who was literally worshiping uh, well, the Baals and the Asherahs. Um, and then he also had to lead men who I would assume knew that he was the one who was sitting in the vineyard threshing wheat rather than being on top of the hill where he should have been. All of us have things that are in our lives that we would view as obstacles, things that we have to overcome, try and figure out, try to get through. But with God's presence in our lives, we can do that. Thirdly, God's sovereign presence in our lives helps us deal with personal temptations. Gideon could have been king. He could have been king. Israel, not just Manasseh, not just parts of the tribes, all of Israel came to him and said, hey, we want you to be king. We want you to rule over us. We want your family to be the ones that rule over us. And Gideon says no. Now that being said, did he epically mess up with the golden ephod thing? Yeah. Yeah, he did. But notice how even through that, God still in the New Testament identifies him as a man of great faith, following God in the face of super hard things. When we look at all the judges, we should be heartened. These are men and women who are deeply flawed, deeply flawed, and God uses them in amazing ways. Looking at our own lives, it is easy to forget who we are called to be, who we follow, and why we follow him. But our job is to trust God and he will do the rest. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church, and he says this. So this is 12, verse 9. Each time he said, so this is Paul talking about um, some really hard things that are in his own life. He talks about a thorn in the flesh, and this is after him three different times begging the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. 
So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses, in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's easy to look at the hard things, the flaws, the things that we've done wrong, and say, you know what, God, there's no way you could use me. But God says, no, no, no. I see you, and I see who you could be. Think about how God greets Gideon. He says, mighty warrior. He doesn't just see him as the guy who's sitting in the bottom of a threshing floor, or in a vineyard, rather than where he should be. He instead sees him, no, no, you're going to be a mighty warrior, and you're going to lead Israel. Gideon leads Israel for 40 years. Okay? There's only one other judge that leads longer. Gideon leads as long as David, Saul, Solomon, all of them. Um, and God still uses him. He sees him for who he is and who he could be. God does the same thing in our lives. He says, you know what? You're going to do some amazing things. Follow me, and I'll show you. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for sending Jesus to, to allow that gap between us to be, uh, to be bridged by him, Lord. We thank you that you are a God who is strong when we are weak. You are a God who looks and sees broken vessels and puts us back together so that your light can shine through the cracks. I ask that you would help us to embrace our status as your children, Lord, that we are not just people stumbling through earth trying to figure this out, but rather we are people stumbling through earth following you and doing our best to do that. I thank you for our love for us, even when we mess up. I thank you for your patience with us when we doubt. I thank you for the fact that you are a God who is with us, that your presence is always with us. And we thank you so much for Jesus coming and dying on a cross, taking on humanity, and rising again on the third day. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. As you go, I ask that you would go with the knowledge that we follow a sovereign God who has seen not only where you are, but where you are going to end up. You are dismissed.